we talked about the Clotilda all our lives. We heard about this ship, this ship, this ship, this ship. My dad would say, y'all need to learn, you need to know, you need to know, you need to know, you need to know, you need to know. But it wasn't nothing that I talked about to my friends about. It took four and a half years to finish Descendant. I don't even know how many times I read Barracoon. It was kind of the guiding force of the movie in a certain way. A hundred. I, I have no idea. That would maybe be a low, a low ball. It depends on what scenes we were shooting the crew size. For Verite, it was either um, it was pretty small, like five people. But when we were using steady cams, which was real when we were shooting the Zorniel Hurston um sections, the crew was much bigger, like maybe 12 people. We used to see 300 and we used and Alexa. But mostly, I mean, gosh, 80% of the film is on the C300. The way my mother told me, Timothy Mayer, a local businessman, made a bit that after slavery was abolished, that he could still bring Africans into the country. He went and brought them back here and burned the ship to conceal the crime. I made a film called Order of Myths 16 years ago. And that film um, was about segregated Mardi Gras in Mobile, Alabama. And when we started filming, my mother said to me, the white Mardi Gras queen this year, because there's a white Mardi Gras queen and a black Mardi Gras queen, is from the Mayer family. And that family brought the last slave ship to the United States. And I think you should know that when you're making this film. And it wasn't important in a holistic way right away until we realized that the Black Mardi Gras queen, Stephanie Lucas, was descended from the Clotilda. And we realized that the two Mardi Gras queens were connected through the Clotilda ship. So I actually made another film in the community 16 years ago. And so when I came back, some people knew who I was. I mean, you kind of alluded to this, but you, you are a white filmmaker and you're telling the story um, about the impact on a Black community. Um, was that uh, difficult at all? Um, did yes. you feel uncomfortable at times? Um, I just, well, when I started, I thought the Mayer family, the white family who brought the ship would speak to me because they had Helen Mayer was the white Mardi Gras queen in Order of Myths. And she had she had gone with me to Sundance. She'd gone with me to other countries to promote the movie. I thought I had something no one else had, which was access to this family that wasn't speaking to any of the press when there, it seemed like the ship might be discovered. So I thought I had this access. Um, when it turned out that that access was probably when there's the specter of a ship actually being uncovered, this family, they weren't going to talk. I'm a white woman telling a film about the Black experience, and it's very much a Black story. And, um, you know, I didn't think I was the perfect person to tell the story, but I was the person who was there. When you started shooting, they had not found the Clotilda yet. I mean, did you, were you no. concerned that like, that was uh, that the whole film hinged on that discovery or did you did that I actually like uh, <laughs> this is going to sound insane but not at all because um I wasn't concerned they wouldn't find the Clotilda because this is a community of people that have been telling the story passing it down in their family through 160 years and they've been told they can't tell the story like there's there's a lot of fear of lynching so it's, it's a story that's been passed down and, and held in families. And so these are master storytellers. So pretty early on, I knew that like whether or not they found the Clotilda, it didn't matter. This I knew this these were the voices to center because they were such powerful characters and such powerful voices. So I, I kind of what Joycelyn says in the movie, I don't care about the ship. I, I very much felt the same way. How should I say this? I don't want the momentum of the story to just be focused on the ship. It's not all about that ship. When you walk into Africa Town, it smells like asphalt. It smells like, you know, pollution. It smells like if, if environmental racism has a smell, that's what Africa Town smells like. I knew all along I wanted to somehow translate this smell into a film. Um, and into the kind of, you feel the injustice just standing there. My first phone call when I started making the film was to Karn Jackson, who I'd collaborated with on The Order of Myths. And he was he was a co-writer on this and a producer. And then a friend of mine, Essie Chambers, who had been a producer, and then we sort of started talking about the movie organically. And it became clear to um, myself and Kyle Martin, my other longtime producer who's white, 
that SE would be a great addition to the team because this is where I'm from. I also do think that white people need to do the hard work, but I also knew that, you know, again, this is, I'm not the perfect person to tell the story, so I better get it right. And I mean, as a team, that was what we were really tasked with. And SE really helped me. I think it was a collaborative process. It, this wasn't like a film where I was the singular voice. Like this was very collaborative. I, and I know there's lots of Africa towns all over. When we've shown this film in other cities, people have come up to me and said, that's my community. Like my community is like Africa town. There's a tradition of people putting polluting sites next to black communities. So that part of it to me was, it was so connected to a larger, a larger American story. You know, that's, that's one obvious thing, but there's also, you know, the story of the South and the lie we tell ourselves about what our history is. When you think about like who was literate when this happened in 1860, like it's white men of privilege, you know? And so when you think about like, you know, the task of retelling American history, um, it, it seemed like it was bigger than Africa Town. Well, th that's a really interesting point that you're talking about the lie that we tell ourselves, because obviously this film is coming out at a time where uh, the teaching of history has been so heavily politicized. I think the film fits in with a much larger conversation, obviously, about suppressed histories. And um, and, and I'm really glad it's coming out right now because it's a, it's a, it's, um, you know, I didn't know if this was dangerous or not, but when the film came out, a bunch of um, school teachers started sending us pictures of them showing the film in their classroom, sort of as like an act of resistance. And some of the people in the film were worried that they would get fired because of that, because of this just showing a film about history to school children. I, I don't want to use the word crazy because it's, our, it's the moment we're in, but isn't that sad that this film, which we have fact-checked and you know have been very rigorous about what we put in the film, is like suppressed in some way. And, and that's part, I and mean, that's not just this film, you know, it's other films and books and all kinds of things that are taught. Making this film makes me think a lot about what history is. History is a bunch of lore. History, like unless you can find something that's buried in the ground or something like a ship, I would call it all, you know, I, I it, it definitely made me think a lot about like what I'm accepting as fact. Um, because it really is about who gets to tell it in this very real way. And I've always heard, oh yeah, history is told by the winner. I never really thought about that in a really strong way until I made this film, which sounds maybe very ignorant, but this movie, man, it was, you would really see like how like the dominant narrative could could possibly just be made up. There was a lot of white people in Mobile who didn't even believe that the Clotilda existed until the ship got discovered. But by 2019, Africa Town is completely surrounded every direction by some form of heavy industry. What person want to wake up knowing that they sitting on historic land, but they got to smell the chemicals from a factory? Talk a little bit about working with Higher Ground uh, Productions and, and the Obama's company. Um, and what do you have a sense of what it was about this film that inspired them to uh, to get involved too? I mean, I think they were very much inspired by this reclamation of storytelling. They came and um, surprised everyone at the Martha's Vineyard African American Film Festival, and they were really wowed by you know the telling of African American stories and the reclaiming of history and um, the power in that. And also um, the community organizing part of the pu puzzle too. I also thought that the interview that you did with the woman who is the former real estate agent where she's talking about, you know, what does this discovery mean and what, what impact will it have on this community and, and how will it be a positive impact that we can all share in? I mean, Vita definitely voices the feeling of, of many in the community about um, sure. And it's a conversation, by the way, that continues um, because, you know, there's a there's an impact campaign that goes alongside this film. And the film ends at this moment where, you know, you don't know what's going to happen. Like this is an ongoing story. Like we, we we ended the film, but the story goes on. The ship has still it's been found. But will it be raised up? Brian Stevenson's um, museum in in Montgomery, EJI. Will this community get the same kind of enormous revenue from cultural tourism that, that that museum is getting three hours to the north. We don't know 
how the city is going to support this. And I think Vita voiced what so many in the community felt that we could celebrate this discovery and the acknowledgement by the world of what happened here. But will we be the ones that benefit from this? Will we be the ones who get to tell our own story? How do we make that happen? How do we control that? And to me, that's the question of the whole film. I worked with participant. Um, they made the film with me. And one of the reasons I wanted to work with them is they always do an impact campaign alongside a film. And so I knew when I was making the film that there would be a whole other part when the film was over the day the film came out, you know, the impact campaign launched, which we'd been planning, you know, since since Higher Ground and Netflix bought the film, we started even before that, I think we started planning. And so I knew that it, the work was just starting. I saw uh, that the Mayor family has actually met with the descendants, that 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 took place a couple of weeks ago, I think about a week and a half ago. Um, what happened there? And I mean, it's complicated what happened there. They definitely didn't meet with the whole community. They met with a few people who I would say don't necessarily speak for the whole community. Mm. And um, a lot of these meetings are happening behind closed doors. Um, I don't know how it's going to play out, but it seems like it's net positive. But I mean, they made a they made an announcement two days after the film came out that they were speaking to the community. I wish they talked to me the many times they asked when I was making the film. And I think the pressure of a film being seen by millions of people on Netflix was probably the catalyst more than me calling them up. Um, but, uh, you know, um, I want to see what happens now. I don't think, I mean, there's other impacts that have happened since the film, like some industry has um, moved out of Africa town or is in the process of moving out of Africa town, which is really great. Um, and I kind of just want to see what actually happens when the dust settles. That's what I'm interested in. As a child, I thought the story was sad. Now, I don't get sad no more. Because we still here. My only fear is for my people's story not to be told.